Well, wasn't this fantastic news when we all heard about it from National Public Radio a little over a year ago, that Americans are eating less meat? The results of this NPR poll, poll were snatched up and broadcast on websites everywhere. We're finally making progress, right? No. No, the whole story, as usual, wasn't told. Although we ate 1.5 pounds less beef last year per capita, our country still produced, meaning we raised, slaughtered, and packaged over 2 billion pounds of beef one year. And even if the U.S. is eating less beef, 1.5 pounds less beef in 2013, consumption and production of all other animal products in our country went up. The U.S. now consumes more turkey per person than any other country in the world, and our yogurt consumption is up 400%. Globally, there's been a 50% increase in consumption of animals and animal products just in the last 15 years. Beef production and raising cattle is predicted to increase 5% each year annually over the next six years, while poultry production is, is expected to double. The demand to raise, slaughter, and eat animals is hardly believable. Last year, the one-year figures look like this. So you call that progress. And, and what exactly does the phrase eating less meat mean here? A, a, a ton less here or there? And if we really try to change someone's diet, and we try to make them eat healthier, look what happens. <laughs> yeah, well, we're not doomed yet. But at this stage, one would have to ask, what are all the conservation groups doing about this problem? You know, the ones we give our money to. <laughs> are they telling their 40 million members to stop eating animal products? Hardly. C certainly these groups must know about the global depletion food choice connection, and they're doing something about it, right? No, the answer is they're not. All these groups are concerned about climate change, no problem there, but none of them, not one of these groups, has made a statement about the profound effect eating animals has on our environment, despite the fact that it does, and despite the fact that we've entrusted these groups to preserve and protect our planet. Where's all of our donated money going? There's a superb documentary about this very problem that'll be released quite soon. Please check back on my website or Facebook or Twitter for some updates. Aside from those conservation groups who are clearly in the dark, there are a few researchers and a few organizations that are quite aware of the dire predicament that we're in and the very short timelines we're faced with. Any of these folks will bluntly tell you that our species is in a state of unsustainability and that we can't remain on this course for very much longer. It's not just me. But not one of them is connecting that final dot. Not one of them. They continue telling us that our survival is in peril and we need to change. But change what exactly? And they make it very clear that we should all stop over-consuming and over-producing. But over-consuming and over-producing what? Again, fossil fuels and waste are very easy targets for them to point their fingers at. There's a serious failure by these experts, all, all tremendous researchers, but they just can't get themselves around to recommending that final move to a fully plant-based diet. Why aren't we getting the truth from those with platforms, those who are guiding us? It's because of three reasons. First, many are comfortably unaware, like those conservation groups. And those that are partially aware, such as those researchers, simply can't get themselves around or can't bring themselves around to making the right statement because they themselves consume animals. After all, how can we expect one of our leaders to guide us toward health and restoration of our planet if they can't even do it for themselves? And lastly, many of our leaders are afraid. <laughs> That's right, they are afraid. They're afraid they're going to lose their audience, and they're very afraid of the powerful meat dairy, and fishing industries. They're afraid to do the right thing while we slowly sink. We're only here on Earth for what could be considered a fleeting moment of time, and yet we can do this much damage to ourselves and to our planet, to future generations because of the choices we make. Ask yourself and those around you, and have them ask this simple question on a daily basis. Is the food we're about to eat in the best interest of all living things. Regarding sustainability, then, please picture two points in time and space. Point A is where we currently are as a global community. Point B is where we need to go, the point of true sustainability. Now, we're very far away from point B, and there's a vast sea of challenges between the two. Most businesses 
and individuals, policymakers, organizations in the world are getting on board a very large, powerful ship at point A trying to get to sustainability, but their navigators don't know how to get to point B. Their, their compasses are broken. Their GPS systems aren't working, which is very dangerous because all those on this large ship think they're going to make it to point B, but they won't. They're floating around further and further from it in a zone that I call pseudo-sustainability. And worse, there's a narrowing timeline before point B will be too far away and they'll never make it. Now, a few of us sitting on the dock at point A can clearly see point B and we know how to easily get there. We could probably just hop in and swim there. <laughs> but here's the kicker. We can't get there by ourselves. Getting to the point of true sustainability, point B, is a collective effort. We have to move the critical mass. We have to take all those on, the, on board that other large ship with us. We need to travel together and quickly enough or none of us are going to make it. That's the way sustainability is. Therefore, our leaders, those steering that very large, powerful ship with most of the world on it, our leaders need a new navigation system. Some argue that it's unrealistic to ask the global population to eliminate meat, dairy, and fish, not only as a functional change, but, but behavior psychologists would suggest that we not even use words such as eliminate, stop, or don't when advocating change in food choice or any type of change because that's too negative. It creates barriers such as feeling of infringement of individual rights. So instead, many suggest to use the approach of kindly asking everyone to please begin replacing or pe begin substituting animal products with plant-based alternatives because you shouldn't tell anyone that they might have something taken away or to stop an unhealthy habit even though it's adversely affecting them and everything and everyone around them. Don't infringe on their individual rights. Really, is, is that so? Just, just where would you use the words replace or kindly substitute here? You know, I, I understand the importance of empowerment through the spoken word, but at some point in time, the seriousness of a situation must dictate an action to be taken, regardless of what words happen to be chosen. It's time we switch out whose rights we're worried about here. <clears throat> Knowing everything I've talked about today, there's certainly ample reason for feeling quite discouraged, isn't there? Anyone feeling discouraged here? Yeah, sure, I understand. Regarding loss of our planet's life systems, what we've done to our planet, there's so much bad news around us. And even with increased awareness, it seems we'll be constantly fighting an uphill battle. But in the midst of potential despair, there can be found great news. The bomb in the room doesn't have to go off. We can spread the word and we can defuse it. There's an easy solution to global depletion and most of climate change. We don't have to destroy our planet or ourselves to eat. In fact, it's the other way around, but we must change, and it is a choice. We need to eliminate, excuse me, substitute or replace the, the practice of raising, harvesting, slaughtering, and consuming animals. It must be comprehensive in scope, and we must do it now if we want to save lives, including our own. Now, there's great news in all this because the food choices that are optimal for our planet's health, as you know, happen to be the very same food choices that optimize our own health. You know what? We could all be heroes. That's right. All of us. We could even be superheroes. <laughs> swooping down and saving lives and saving our planet with every single thing we eat every single day. Yeah, a superhero. I'm feeling better already. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you. You know, something quite telling happened at the end of the annual Global Climate Change Conference that we talked about earlier. In her closing remarks, the Executive Secretary of the conference, Christiana Figueres, provided a summary of the conclusions of 200 nations, NGOs, researchers, by stating this about our future, about greenhouse gas emissions, and about climate change. She said this, the science is unquestionable. Therefore, despite the obvious effects on the industry itself, we must call for the elimination of the use of coal as an energy source. And we must do this immediately. Now, notice that she didn't say anywhere in there 
She didn't say that we should use less coal or for us to use only local or humane coal. <laughs> I'm pretty sure I didn't hear her say that. And I also didn't hear her say that we should all go coal less on Mondays. <laughs> In fact, she said we should eliminate coal, even though coal carries with it only a fraction of the greenhouse gas emissions that raising livestock does. And coal has no real direct effect on water scarcity, world hunger, loss of biodiversity, and all other areas of global depletion, but raising and eating animals does. So, the door has been opened, hasn't it? Perhaps inadvertently <laughs> by Ms. Figueres and 200 nations. But as far as I'm concerned, the global stage for massive food choice change has been set. If there is an imminent threat to our planet and to us, which there is, well, we should certainly be able to call for its elimination and and for it to be done immediately. So I encourage and challenge everyone to become more aware about your food choices, seek more accurate definitions, understand the timelines, and appreciate the ticking cancerous bomb that we're faced with. And then let's all commit to making a difference. But not just in our own health or our own life. No, let's commit to making a difference in someone else's life. And let's commit to making a difference in the long-term health of our planet. But let's do it now, not later. We might not have a later. <laughs> and let's think about making a difference every single day of the week, not just on Mondays. Be the, be the compass. Be the superhero for those around you, guiding them and the ship they're on to point B before that door closes. That my friends, is what sustainability and positive change to achieve it is really all about. With that in mind, let's all of us here in this room right now, let's all of us go out and inspire others to become aware. Thank you so very much.